This is something that I'm very excited to do. Chile has been doing a lot of really cool things in the last couple of decades with teacher education that the United States has not done so much of. Um, so my expertise is in language teacher education and specifically working with English language teachers here. Um, so there were two reforms in the early 2000s. One is Programa Inglés Abre Puertas, which um, actually upped the emphasis on English language teaching in Chile in schools. Um, and it set standards for what schools should be doing in terms of teaching English. And it, the part that's really relevant here is that it provided a lot of funding that's ongoing to um, English teachers for professional development, for materials, a um, lot of things. And then at around the same time, teacher education standards were being reformed um, to make sure that new teachers really had a lot of chances to do in-school practical teaching. So rather than just staying in their universities and studying, they were out in schools doing multiple years of teaching practice. Um, it also, though, for English teachers, set a very high bar for their English proficiency. So the CEFR is the um, Common European Framework of Reference, which is an international way of measuring language proficiency, and it's in six bands. A1, A2 is beginning, B1, B2 is intermediate, and C1, C2, C2 is essentially fluent and able to do just about anything. And they said that school teachers in Chile need to have a C1 level proficiency, so really high level of fluency, um, which is relatively doable if you're in a big city surrounded by people who don't speak Spanish necessarily, like Santiago. But when you get out into the regions where you don't necessarily have a lot of access to people who don't speak Spanish, it's a lot harder. And um, so at Universidad de Atacama, they said their students frequently are coming in with an A2 level. So they've gone through high school, finished all these years of English study, and yet still really can't carry out a conversation in English. And they've got four years, five years, to bring their English up to this high level of fluency while also learning how to teach. Um, so they have a very a big burden of what needs to happen during their undergraduate study. Um, the other thing that got changed was how programs are assessed. And so um, what's now, um, so even though there are standards, national standards for what language teachers need to be able to do, each institution is allowed to set their own means of assessment. And so um, at Universidad de Atacama, they came up with some really interesting things, which is part of why that's where I want to go. So here's the university. Um, Atacama, in general, um, and Copiapó especially, is very focused on mining. That's their number one industry, and um, the university was founded as the School of Mines in 1857. So it's been around for 150 years, but primarily focused on technical, um, technical aspects. It, um, expanded, became a more comprehensive institution, and by 1981, the magic year of um, university issues in Chile, um, it became the Universidad de Atacama and is able to grant um, degrees in mostly professional fields, engineering, education, technology, law, science, things like that. Um, in terms of English teacher education, it started in 1991. They realized that they needed to have licensed English teachers um, for the schools in the region. I think it's the only um, institution licensing teachers in the Atacama region, the third region. So their responsibility is pretty heavy. Um, like some students will come to other regions to do their graduate or their undergraduate study, but it's pretty much where teachers go if they want to stay in the region. Um, so in English education, they students will study both pedagogy or translation. Um, 
and most of them studying pedagogy, although a few students come in just because they're interested in English, not necessarily wanting to become teachers. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the things that the students need to do is to improve their English proficiency and not just learn how to teach. So it's a double duty. In terms of assessment, the university's, the program has been experimenting with ways of assessing students. And they've done things related to portfolios. So a portfolio in education is usually some sort of a collection of documents where you also write reflections showing what this document means to your learning. Um, 2000, from starting in 2000 to 2008, they had a paper portfolio where students were sticking things in binders. Um, but the problem with this was that um, everybody, every single faculty member wanted something different out of it. And so they ended up with um, 200 indicators that students had to prove through their portfolio, which is a lot. And some of them were very impractical. Um, and so they found, you know, it's really hard to assess this kind of a portfolio. We don't know exactly what these things should look like. Um, how do you, I think one of them was something like, has a professional demeanor. Kind of hard to make a, put in a document that shows you have a professional demeanor. Um, so it was very difficult. And then some of the professors decided that that wasn't enough and they made their students make additional portfolios just for their class. So the students were getting portfolioed out, they were overwhelmed, um, and they, the coordinators found it really didn't help them anyway with understanding whether the students had learned to become teachers. Um, so 2014, they got a big chunk of funding from the Ministry of Education and were able to develop an e-portfolio, an electronic portfolio that they were gonna use for the entire program. So all the teacher education programs, not just English. Um, and what I really like about it is this was a ground up thing. This wasn't the Ministry of Education coming in and saying you will do an e-portfolio. It was actually faculty members from the department saying this is what we want. We want to do it in a way that works for our students, for our teachers, and really shows what we know about um, their learning. And um, so the general idea of a portfolio is you collect a lot of things. Um, for teacher education, frequently it starts with lesson plans and activities that they design during their classes. But as they go out into the schools and do their practice teaching, they also end up with student work so they can show, here's what my students were able to do, um, videos of themselves teaching, various kinds of reflections, websites they design. Um, so there's all kinds of things that go into it, which actually an electronic format makes much easier as well. Um, then you select. So given the standards that you need to demonstrate you know how to do, which documents show that you can do that the best? Um, and then you reflect. And so you look at a document and you say, this is what this shows about my learning. Here's the process I used to make it. Here's where I feel like I did well. Here's where I still have some struggles. Here are my plans for improving on this skill. Um, and it really allows the process to show, not just the thing. One of the things they were able to do with this money they got is to actually take an entire classroom and turn it into their e-portfolio classroom. So they were able to buy computers, they got furniture, um, they have this awesome smart board, um, and so they can actually use this for supporting students because a lot of their students are not from wealthy families and um, they don't have a lot of resources on their own. Because in the, in the research, one of the big concerns with <coughs> e-portfolios is if students don't have access to computers, they can't do it. And so the university said, well, let's use this money to make a place where they can do it. Um, they don't have to have their own computer. They can come in. If they have a laptop, there's Wi-Fi, there's couches. They can just sit around and work on it on their own. Um, and. So they really were able to think of ways to support the students. Um, they also require all the first year students to do a one hour a week class in the e-portfolio classroom where they have a teacher who walks them through the process of setting it up, using the platform, um, writing the reflections, things like that. 
Um, so there's the teachers out there in a session in the classroom. Um, so what makes it an important part of their assessment process um, is that the artifacts are aligned with the standards. So the, the Ministry of Education sets standards for teachers. They select artifacts that show that they have met those standards. Um, they reflect on it. So there's a lot of writing in English for the English teachers um, about their learning. And um, they also do peer response. So their um, students actually will look at each other's work and give each other feedback, which is a really useful part of building a community as well. Um, and then they were able to pay developers to create a custom platform. They looked at a lot of the commercially available platforms and none of them quite met what they wanted. And so they actually used this money to build a platform that's exactly what they want, where students can upload different kinds of media, they can write their reflections, the teachers can then log in and score them and give them feedback. Uh, it's really amazing. Um, and they got some graphic design help out of it too. Uh, so anyway, the assignments, um, they really tried to scaffold or structure how the students write it because they are, they're writing in English but they're still developing their English as well. And so um, it's, uh, they are given guiding questions, how to write about it. Um, they also do a few reflective writing activities that are separate from reflecting about the um, tasks. One of them being a, a philosophy of teaching statement. So what do you, what kind of teacher are you? Well, how do you, what do you believe about teaching? And um, they wrote one in their first year and now we're coming up on the, the students that were freshmen the first year that they did it are now juniors and seniors and so they'll be writing another one looking back at what they thought they were when they first entered the program and now that they've actually had some experience learning how to teach what they are and what they think about themselves as teachers so that's part of what i'm really interested in oh if that was um so i have a lot of questions that i want to <coughs> examine um, sorry, this is my notes or separate document. Um, but what I'm really interested in is, is looking at the reflective writing. I study teachers learning how to teach writing. And so I'm really interested in the fact that these are English learners. They're not fluent English speakers yet, but they're learning to do academic writing and to write reflectively um, in English about their work. And so I'm really interested in looking at how do they reflect on the artifacts that they've chosen? What do they think reflection means? Um, in language teacher education, we've got tons of books about reflection and they all have very different stances. And so I'm intrigued to see what do the teacher candidates who are actually doing the reflection, what do they think reflection is? Um, how is reflective writing taught? So what are the the lecturers and the professors who are teaching these classes doing in their classes to teach writing. Um, what's difficult for the students? And um, thinking about the e-portfolio itself, how does that actually help or hinder their reflective writing? Um, there's been some discussion about how the shininess of electronic formats makes reflection a bit more superficial. Students write things just to get through with it. Um, they, they spend a lot more time selecting and doing like multimodal design to make fancy looking stuff, but the reflection itself is a bit more superficial. Whereas if you're just looking at something and writing on paper, you put a lot more thought into the reflection part. So I'm interested to see if that's what's happened here um, or not. So my research is low tech. Um, I'm going to do ethnographic observation in classes, sit in the back, take notes, um, see what's going on in their classes, interview the students, interview the teachers, talk about what they're learning, how they're going about doing it, have the students show me their portfolios and tell me more about what they did in choosing the items that they put into it, um, analyze the portfolios, the writing that the students are doing, those kind of things. Um, 
The other thing that I've been asked to do is to help the professors in the department develop their own research projects looking into their teaching. And so um, I'll be doing some workshops for them on action research, ways of researching your teaching while you're in the process of teaching, um, which is very much a cyclical process. It can't be planned out in, in advance. You really don't know variables that you could be analyzing for. Um, but it usually starts with identifying something you want to understand better in your teaching, potentially designing a, an intervention of some sort, um, and then collecting data from your students on what they're doing with whatever is going on in the classroom, analyzing it, and potentially changing the way you're teaching. Um, so my thought is over this next semester that we'll get started at the beginning and then have ongoing meetings where the, teach, the instructors, professors who are doing the research will meet and we'll talk about the data they're collecting and their study designs. Um, I'll also be teaching a class for their fourth year English major students on writing and education, which will include writing and reflecting on their artifacts. So I'm hoping this all kind of ties together as one cohesive project. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for a couple of questions. A couple of questions, yes. I'm, I'm curious about, the, I mean, and I guess this is part of what you're going to investigate, is how they're acting, you know, what kinds of prompts, you know, that they're getting, uh, the students are getting. Yeah, so that's. How, how they're being graded on the reflection, and if they're writing, you know, for the grade, and then if the mm. peer reviews are also then guided by yeah. what they think, you know, they should be doing. That I'm not sure of yet, and it's definitely part of what my research is going to be looking at. Um, I, my understanding from my colleagues is that they've been sort of doing a recursive process of developing their grading rubrics. Um, so they, when they first started, they had something, but then they did some practice grading, and they realized it wasn't quite the right rubric. And, oh, it's very hard, yeah. To get students to not focus on what's being graded versus exactly you know, what, yep. you know, what you're hoping they're doing through the yes the yeah. yeah so, so that's, that's writing, writing assessment, assessment is one of my interests so I will okay. be looking yeah. into what they're doing and yeah. how it's going yeah thanks yeah one more question when you um, made that comment that the electronics tends to mm -hmm. make the writing more shallow. Mm -hmm. Um, what jumped into my mind was looking at my two s children, one who was without electronics for his sophomore and junior years and senior year of high school, and one that that phone was attached to her hand. <laughs> yeah. and, and the, the difference, difference in how they relate to people. Mm -hmm. One judges themselves by the response others give, and the other one judges himself as what he has evaluated himself internally. Hmm. And it's yeah. like almost a society thing of a generation that has had these electronics. I wonder if that's part of what you're seeing rather than just could this be. item that's there. Yeah, it, it could very well have to do with a lot of external factors as well as the, the, the generation itself. almost. Could be, although yeah, some of the research studies that I've read, it's been two classes at the same institution at the same oh, wow. time where one is doing a paper portfolio and one's doing a computer portfolio. Oh, wow. And that's that's interesting. So same kind of students in the same program and that kind of stuff. But it is part of thinking about what counts as reflection, too. I mean, is multimodal design actually a part of it? You know, are, are they not necessarily thinking so much in terms of the words they're using as all the pieces that go together? You choose the right song to go with the right animation, to go with the right color scheme. That's a part of it. It's not just putting words on paper anymore, so. Well, I thought that was in, that caught my attention so much that I reflected back and was like, that was classic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but there are some generational differences too. Yeah. Right. Thank you so Thank much. You.